So thank you guys. Uh, again, my name is Bach Nguyen, and I'm also marketing for marketing, but I'm more responsible for the integrations parts too, as well as BizDev and other things. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about the Trezor Core, the firmware or the operating system that runs on the Trezor Model T. As Wojtek has said, it's basically in Python. So the applications or the use cases that are running in the device are written in Python. The decision to choose Python is that it's relatively easier to compare to C. The device still uses C libraries and C for cryptography. But if you're developing coin support only, uh, you will not interact with, this, with the C language at all. You will use Python. And this choice is already proven as a good decision because, as mentioned, Monero, Stellar, Lisk, and the coin support, the new coins that are coming in a few weeks, they are written entirely by the community. It's not us, it's not Satoshi Labs that actually wrote those features. Uh, we, did a, we decided to leave this to the third party in order to maximize our efforts in making sure the device is safe and secure. We do the code review, we accept all kinds of third, uh, third uh, party integrations and developments, but we make sure that the code is okay. And so now, thanks to that, in the next firmware release we'll have way more points than we usually can do. The second thing that I wanted to say is that we have been talking about the development for Model T. We, I, haven't, I didn't mention the development for Trezor 1, and a lot of people ask us, is it a dead device? Is it end of life? Uh, what are we going to do with it? We just bought it. Um, when we announced the price discount, we also announced that the Trezor 1 will get a new life. It's a new era for it. Because right now, the team, the core team, the Trezor core team, is working on porting the firmware, Trezor Core, back to the Trezor 1. So, mm -hmm. All the features that are now running on Trezor Model T and the hardware of Trezor 1 supports it. They, once we release this new firmware, the, the Trezor Core for Trezor 1, the Trezor 1 will run, let's say, probably 90% of all the features that Trezor Model T has. So I think that's a bit of an introduction into the Trezor Core system. Well, open up for the questions because I really didn't prepare, I didn't know that I was going to be speaking here today. So I'm just like, yeah. So how far along is the uh, zip improvement for uh, basically making the shower secret cherry available to the seeds? I think the Pavel, uh, our CTO, has been working on it for a few weeks now. I don't know and I can't tell you the ETA because it's, I can tell you the ETA, it's two weeks, you know, it's always two weeks. But yeah, we're definitely looking into making that new standard and pushing it through uh, to our own to our users because we believe that Shamir's Secret is a perfect way how to keep your seat safe while delegate, yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, before there were a few standards, so you have the, um, the standard that it's usually 24 words or 12 words. So the seed, and then you have like a maybe a option password, which if it's not provided, it's empty. Never, uh, from that you derive all the private keys. And uh, the case is that usually how you split up the private key to make it more secure, like you want to store it with like your wife and maybe your parents mm -hmm. and the safe deposit box or something. So if you file a find paper and it's not encrypted, no one can access the key. They can actually or they need like three out of five papers or something. Yeah. And um, the usual way how it's done, that's done, that's the uh, secret chair by Shamir, um, or <coughs> triple or quadruple um, uh, S, basically. And that's usually horribly complicated because it's basically a sheet of numbers per, um, uh, per part. So it's horrible to type in, it's not a user friendly kind of thing. And there were a few proposals uh, from the community kind of thing that uh, because we know um, the 24 words kind of thing, uh, we could model it around that. So instead of having a random numbers kind of thing or a random characters to, for each part, you actually have another 24 words. So that kind of the fragmented things of memory yeah. in a memory. Yes. Uh, yes. And that would be very Before that, there was like spots. one implementation. Um, it was like a JavaScript written thing. Um, 
and it wasn't standardized. So that came up, I think, last week or something, as a zip, which is the Satoshi Labs improvement protocol. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Stig, actually, Stig actually talked about this at the Honey Badger conference, which was just this weekend. Uh, we are working on that proposal. Uh, he's w uh, formalizing it essentially, and we're going to do at the end of, uh, M of N, where you can decide inside the Trezor Wallet interface which which combinations, which how many parts you want, and, and so on. So we just in the break discussed that this feature would be cool. I didn't know yeah, yeah, very yeah, sure. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Question: uh, so that that means that Trezor will actively. Support it like you generate it in the treasure, yep. and then you can export parts of the key in this uh, secret sharing key regime. It's gonna work during the same backup procedure as already you have already have now. So instead of getting a recovery seat in 24 words, you can choose to split that recovery seat into this <coughs> secret uh, secret sharing me mechanism during onboarding. So at the beginning when you first as set up the device, you can only do it during onboarding. I think, yeah. Uh, that would be a requirement because otherwise. Right, that's one of the things. Or you can also, if we make it inside the Trezor wallet, we can also do it that you enter your seat into the interface and then it's going to create that sheet. Okay, you re enter it and yeah. improve knowledge. Yeah. 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 Because we want to be able to give this feature to the users that we have already and we don't want to force them to generate a new wallet. So, yeah, but that's, that's all about the UI, UX implementation of the of, of side of the thing. Okay. Uh, why should I use a Trezor over uh, another hardware wallet like the a Ledger? So, I don't know if you talked about this, I probably missed it at the beginning, but Trezor is entirely open source from bottom up, which means the, the hardware schematics are online. Uh, the system that runs on it is also available on GitHub. Uh, you can actually build the firmware yourself and then compare the builds uh, with the one that you know, we release and see that the code which is running there on the device is actually uh, generated or what we say it is. And it has a few benefits. It lets you or the community know that we are actually not putting backdoors in there and trying to steal your money when you're not looking. Um, the, and that's, that's one way how to do hardware works. It's completely open source, completely transparent. And then there's another way how to do hardware wallets, and that's by using secure <coughs> elements. They are more resistant to physical attacks. On the other hand, you don't know what's running inside them. You don't know the code that's running inside them. Um, and we believe that transparency is better than obscurity, in, in this sense. Also, uh, Trezor is supposed to protect you, or hardware wallets essentially are supposed to protect you against <coughs> attacks over the network, over the internet. Once somebody has physical access to you, I mean, no, it doesn't matter if you have a Trezor or a computing device, they can bust your kneecaps and you're going to tell them your C words. I mean, that's <laughs> so that's why we believe that open source is better. Yeah, that's why Trezor. Yeah. Um, I think uh, a couple of months ago there was a bug found in the Trezor wallet that uh, and it was um, exploitable via USB. <coughs> Can you um, give us some info about that, uh, how it was um, found and how I think it was resolved very quickly with a new version? Mm -hmm. and nothing happened at all, but... but um was this the one found by Christian Ritter? Do you remember the name of the researcher? Maybe. Or writer? I think it was exploitable uh, via USB, that's what uh, Jochen said, at least. Jochen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, it, this, this bug was found by a... Uh, master's student or PhD, I, I'm not sure anymore, but it was a student of Jochen's. And he basically uh, plugged in the device and uh, ran streams of data at it. So he basically attacked and tried to overflow the device. And he managed to do so after several iterations, uh, which then allowed him to write and read into the protected part of the memory, I think, if I remember correctly. We, we have a whole write up online, I, I'm not sure if you read it. Um, and this was exploitable uh, in physical presence if you had physical access to the device but uh, thanks to him we actually managed to close it in a pretty quick time I think it was it took a few weeks to, to close it it was we don't have any records of it being exploited yeah uh, and there's oh, sorry I'll get back to it there is a report on our blog we or we, we make sure that all these security incidents we publish them transparently because that's part of the open source ethos. Uh, you mentioned that a lot of uh, coin support is uh, coded by the community. Mm -hmm. So when I buy a new 
uh, Trezor. This is not included, I guess. I get it. Yeah. That only the company firmware and device <coughs> choose to load a plugin. It is reviewed by you, yeah. so you sign it off. And uh, but I don't have to trust third parties if I only want to deal with Bitcoin. E so uh, the thing is, the code runs. The code is supplied by the, the community to us, mm -hmm. and we import it and we uh, put it into the official firmware after we code review it. Uh, so all the code is very carefully reviewed before it's put into into the official firmware. Okay, but even a brand new uh, Trezor will have support for plenty more coins by user code. Yes, if you up, choose to update the derivative firmware once it's released. Okay, but yeah. firmware update, security issues, firmware update is necessary. Right. So it's not like a plug-in system no, where it's you can choose. One. It's uh, a habit and. Uh, Okay, it's not an application-based system, it's all monolithic in, in one firmware. And then uh, you mentioned that I can build my own version of the firmware, so it builds deterministically? Yes. <coughs> nice. Yeah. What is the procedure and the cost to integrate a new coin? So, we don't accept money for <laughs> coin integrations. <laughs> it's essentially free. If, but it's all, the only thing it costs is your development time. You put the money into it and yeah. So first of all, you can contact either me or go over our development channel. You contact our developers and tell them that you want to work on this. They will give you the resources like the code base, some code documentation that's available, and then you can start off working on it. Um, there is a Trezor Model T emulator running on uh, running just off the source code. So you can debug it using that. And let's say you're working on a big important coin or you just talk to us, we can send you a device, sample device to develop on. That's not a problem. Oh, so I have a working pull request, you review it and it's yeah. 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 <laughs> so another question, uh, you mentioned that uh, the Trezor software is in huge parts written in uh, Python, right? Yeah. That means uh, there's some Linux running on the Trezor? Or? No, we have, it's, our own, it's our own system. We wrote it from scratch, from bottom up, and it's actually not Python, it's MicroPython. So there's a MicroPython and, and interpreter that uh, runs on the ARM devices, and Trezor runs on an ARM uh, microchip. So, yeah. This is that. Uh, 173, I think, right? Something like that. 173, 174, yeah, yeah, I can't remember the numbers. Um, yes, we that talked about this because it's one of the uh, pre-requirements for hardware wallets to work with Bitcoin Core full nodes uh, or Windows system. Uh, I think once it's finalized, once it's is it finalized actually? Uh, then if if we see a large you know support for it in clients, then we will work on we will probably work on implementing it in Trezor too. Because it's it's very important, especially for offline signing. Once you can plug in the Model T and sign you a transaction that's only on SD cards, and you can move the SD card and uh, yeah, trans send it through the Bitcoin Core. That'd be great. Yep. Mm, I have also a question about uh, the uses of um, this hardware wallet. Um, what do you think? Um, how can we use those hardware words together? I mean, the wisdom exchange. Because uh, I'm as a trader, I totally have my trust in the exchange. Mm -hmm. I have there in my portfolio, I think, so many so different kinds of coins. And if I try to move all of the private keys, or try to generate a new private keys and store into your uh, hardware words, um, I think the way uh, how how I should trade in the future, I think it will be I mean, uh, very uh, long. Very, it's, not, it's not easy for me because uh, every time um, I want to trade something in the exchange, yeah. I have to move the coin to the price in the exchange and then uh, do the trade. And this will reduce I think, a very large delay uh, yeah. in the trade. I mean, that's, uh, that's the thing that exchanges force you to have like 20 or something confirmations before you can trade those coins. Um, there is no easy answer to that because if you want to put your money on an exchange and you want to trade immediately and quickly, it's better for you to have your money on the exchange. And there's no, there's no, there's no doubt about that. But if you want to have security, if you want to divide your risk somehow, and you know, let's say that you decide not to trust the exchange in the future because 
I think just a few weeks ago, Zyfe was hacked, right? The Japanese yeah, exchange. Japanese one. Yeah, and they lost money. So it's it's all about your how you divide your risk. Um, if you, for instance, leave fifty percent on the hardware wallet or more, um, we have been in some with some in talks with some exchanges to um, to give a treasure preferential treatment. So for instance, when you send a transaction from Trezor Wallet into an exchange, <coughs> then that exchange would accept that with zero confirmations. But it's at very early talks, I can't even tell you with which exchanges we are talking. Um, it puts a lot of trust in also for the exchange in us, and then we have to yeah believe that the customer is doing the right thing. But yeah. But how can a treasure uh, guarantee anything because the user has the seat, he can do whatever he wants onto yeah. another device. And how will anyone know with what kind of device a transaction was sent? API through APIs. So where the exchange can run our API on, on their sites and by using that API, by making sure that the API is sending money from a treasure to a address, then they know it's coming from a treasure. And from an open source device, which definitely has to be a hardware treasure makes not much sense to me, but... Yeah, I mean, it was actually the exchange that came up to, came up okay. to us with this yeah, idea. Wanted, of course, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. But it, again, it's, it's, it's very early talks, and they have to assess their own security, too, because, as you said, there are, there are many, many dangerous edge cases for, yeah, for way, that could be misused against them. Yeah. Do you have mobile apps as well? Can I use that? Yeah. Uh, so right now, the Trezor, Model T runs with Android devices uh, without a problem because the Model T uses web USB for the protocol. <coughs> and Android phones and Chrome have uh, web USB support included. The only problem is that when you're running Trezor Wallet on, on the device, it uses desktop, <coughs> desktop design. So the UX is not good. We are going to be reworking that. There are also apps like Mycelium that work with both Trezor One and Model T. So you use the Mycelium as the interface and you confirm all transactions on the device. And back to that web wallet, um, our web wallet team is currently rewriting uh, the interface into React. So once it's in, once it's completely redone in React, we will be able to uh, build apps on, on mobile very easily and uh, standalone applications on, on the computers. So you won't need to use like a web wallet in the, inside the Chrome or Firefox, but it's going to be a yeah, React app. But that's also that's not available right now. Right? It's also yeah in the future. Yeah, we are working on that right now. Okay. At the moment, it's not very but it's working. Do I understand you right that I run my Chrome browser on my Android? Yeah. yeah. And this Chrome browser detects my my browser? Model T. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Because it uses my USB C protocol and it's a standardized thing. <laughs> but like I say, it's not, it's not beautiful, it's ugly, but it works. Yeah, yeah. It works. I, I, I went to Polis many times and paid with my phone, but yeah, it's not the easy, it's not like, the, the, you know, desktop the websites are not very nice on the phone. So. Well, I used it with a mycelium and that was really Yeah, well. that works better. Yeah. Yes, but that's closed source. Mycelium is open, no? Yeah. It's shared. It's open source, but you're it's not allowed to copy it, you're not allowed to use it, but yeah, yeah, yeah. inspect it. It's the Microsoft license, I yeah. think. Yeah. Okay. Well, <coughs> from the very basics of the Bitcoin, like the private key is stored in the device. But if the device is broken or lost, we can recover it. Yep. So if we can recover it with 24 pneumatics, or is this a private key? That's the master key, yes. From, <laughs> from that, yeah, that's the master key. <laughs> but then, like, I don't know the cryptography behind, but then this 24 pneumatics is a kind of a combination of private and the um, so that's the master key, and from the master key, use it, we can derive all like, a virtually unlimited or practically unlimited number of private keys. And then from that private key, you derive the public key. Um, there is an entire big 32 or 49, and <coughs> so many like, bits written on, on how it works. I don't know the derivation myself, but uh, the child derivation function makes sure that, yeah. So, but from the basic definition, like a, compared to a paper wallet, where you have the two keys, mm -hmm. which is visible now, uh, this paper, the treasure that we 24 yeah. words that we wrote, is kind of the same functioning, but the difference is with the treasure we can see our balance and we can make transactions. 
Well, I actually like the comparison you made because the mnemonic seed, when you write it on the paper, it essentially becomes your paper wallet. But, and it has the same properties of it with it. But when you use that seed, you're using a secure device. So you're, you're making sure that you only have these, the key on two places and you are signing transactions um, privately on the, on the device so that the key never connects to the and that never touches the internet. Yeah, but I can buy another key and copy the uh, yeah. copy the device. Yeah, you can you can make clones of the device with yeah. the same key. Yeah. Uh -huh. So what keeps you far from the reaching the coins compared to a paper device? Is just having the, another one, just buying another one. The difference is, is during your use. It's uh, your usage yeah. of a paper wallet is not safe because you actually have to like scan the QR code or type it in into a computer <coughs> that might be infected with malware or something. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. A paper is hard paper, a <coughs> cloth, and even like there are like you know scratchable ones that some space you can see. I mean, compared to that wallets, and if you're just a holder, you don't want to. Yeah, if you're just a holder. As soon as you want to access it, you want to access the transfer. It's another thing. Yeah. 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 The moment, the moment you want to use or transfer coins from a paper wallet, you are exposing your private key to something, something that's connected to the internet, usually. And that's the danger point. Uh, well, with Trezor, you don't have that because mm -hmm. their device acts as isolation away from the internet. But if you are using a secure, full node Bitcoin core and then you install them properly on a paper wallet, okay, that part yeah. is the risk that's eliminated. Yeah, but, but if you know how to use Bitcoin core, then you're already like the 1%, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on, so it depends on a lot of factors, right? So if you have a full node, yes, but that's connected to the internet. So that's already attackable from remotely, which is not possible by via yeah, half wallets. So usually what people do have things is like this uh, different layers of um, like security. One is your mobile wallet, or maybe a mobile wallet used with a hardware wallet. Uh, that's like your uh, go-to thing. I'm going to the bakery and do something. So if that's gone, maybe she, but it's right. Then you have uh, a treasure, maybe, or um, whatever hardware you buy, and that's more secure. That's only at home. It has uh, maybe a password or a pin added, added to it. So that's more secure. So you don't carry it about around. You don't travel with it, or only in rare cases. And the next one would be probably a multi-sig with uh, different hardware wallets, maybe even different orientations. So maybe a three out of four, two treasures, two ledgers. So if one of the devices or the device got basically infected, uh, you don't lose all the money. And that would be like a good cold wallet already. If you're really like if you like a Satoshi and you're really horrible at like buying a lot of uh, hardware wallets and like doing a ten out of whatever uh, multi sig you might just go with paper, but you still want to split it up. So you don't want to have a million coins on one paper. You still want to either encrypt it with a, like a passphrase or um, do a secret chart by Shamir. And that is like horrible like interaction. So for example, if Satoshi decided to uh, upgrade to a um, native SegWit address or something, he would need to load it in. It's another attack vector because he downloaded a new software. It's not secure and stuff like that. So, it, like the hardware wallet is an in between, and it's like an, a good amount of convenience with a good amount of that works. I would say. Yeah. I mean, this third level, I have several ledgers now. Treasure. But I also am running your full node because you're also responsible to the society to support the network. Yeah. Um, I have another question. You've got a new model out now. Uh, what, I, what was bothering me with the old model was that I could not input my passphrase via the device. Yeah. Yeah. This is a huge security concern for me, mm -hmm. that's why I went to the competition for now. With the new model, can I enter the passphrase now on the device? Yes, you can enter it on, on the device or on the host. Depends so on I can choose, but can choose. Yeah. I can yeah. choose to do it on the device. Mm -hmm. There's also one more difference. Sorry. Uh, there's also uh, with the final one, you can use the matrix entry, and it's mm -hmm. that's only for the C, though. Yeah, also for the C, but okay. for the C, but not for the passphrase, okay. because passphrase can be a string, a random string of alphanumerical characters, and that would be you wouldn't have enough characters place for it even there. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, oh, yeah, the model T is also a little bit different from that one in the fact in the fact that since it has a uh, touch screen, you can input the you input a pen on the device. Which means that the device doesn't communicate with the computer until you unlock it. 
which is unlike the, the Model 1, which has to communicate with the computer in, in order to invoke the pin, no, pin uh, pad. One more question. Um, I don't really remember exactly because it's quite some time ago, but I think if I remember right, when I want to install um, without using the back body, so if you have got the privacy and say use Electrum or whatever, I remember not what exactly, but I had quite some difficulty. Is this easy right now? So if you have an offline computer and want to um, get the connection to so the drivers, basically, uh, is this just a uh, what system are you using? It depends on the system. Ubuntu. Ubuntu. Um, with Linux, there is the thing that you have to manually add the UDEV rules in order for the, the computer to recognize the, de the device. It's not really a problem. So, yeah, <laughs> for, for you, yeah, 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 yeah. For many users, it is. Like, for many Linux users. Also, the Python USB modules for yeah. for Electron. Yeah, it's a hack of it, but it Linux systems. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, uh, I've never, I haven't heard anyone having problems with installing the device or setting up the device via Electron, but I also assume that's not one of the path that most people use. Um, yeah, I don't have to research a look into that, I'm not sure. Also, the device uh, delete its content if you uh, enter the passphrase from? It deletes the device memory after you enter the pin six time, 16 times wrong. So 16 it, times? 16 times. No, but the passphrase is something different. You can yeah. enter any path, passphrase and you get a valid key. So yeah. Yeah. There's, no, there's no wrong passphrase. <laughs> passphrase is a salt. Just it it works as like a salt to, to, to master C. So if you enter the passphrase wrong, uh, you will get an empty wallet. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, but there, there is additional to the passphrase, there is a pin. The, the, the pin, and, yeah. The pin. And if I enter the pin 16 times wrong, yeah. uh, only it gets the wipe. Wipe the Then it gets wiped. Uh, also, if you enter the pin one time wrong, then you have to wait one second, two seconds, four seconds, and then it increases exponentially. So until you get to 16 times, I think you will have to try it for four hours or something. 16, six hours. Mm -hmm. Cumulative download, yeah. Okay. How do I wipe it if I forgot the pin or something? Um, after three times, you uh, after three times you enter the pin wrong, it cancels the um, the treasure wallet. Well, the prompt is cancelled, and then you can go to advanced the, into the, the device advanced settings, which is kind of misleading because you shouldn't get into settings. But um, and then from there you can wipe the device. <laughs> so you can wipe the device now. Okay. And already after a few seconds. Already after a few seconds. Yeah. Because I tried this in the it was a few weeks back, maybe there was an update on some website. Yeah. Um, um, another thing you can do is you plug it in in bootloader mode, and then from bootloader mode you can wipe it directly. Well, by pressing the button. Um, this is for the Trezor uh, 1. Do you have buttons on the touch screen? Uh, you can uh, you push the touch screen. Uh, uh, okay. 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 Touch the touch screen? Yeah, yeah. you have to react to one. Alright. And then it boots the bootloader. Anyone else? Yeah. That's everything. Oh, yeah. So the multi, there's um, um, current integrated. What's that for? That's for future features where we can we, you can store encrypted documents on the SD card, which is the documents will be encrypted with your C, with your uh, uh, private keys inside the treasure. Uh, it can be used. It will be able. Oh. How do I use this conditional? <laughs> um, potentially, you can use it with uh, offline signing, as I said. You just load it raw in the transaction into mm -hmm. it, and the treasure signs it offline. Or like multisig uh, with four different treasures that you just plug it in. Yeah. But that's all like future features. Right now, we don't have it. There is no use for it. And we also didn't talk about a treasure password manager. Oh yeah, password. that would be potentially used to like local storage for uh, storing your passwords or database with your passwords. Okay. Because right now you use the C to basically encrypt the passwords on the server, right? On the server, on the cloud, yeah. Uh, you mentioned SD card, so it doesn't, uh, what can you do with it? SD card? Is it a secure storage? Encrypted storage, like USB slot? Yeah. yeah. Yes. So it works like a USB drive then? Or what? Like a slow encrypted USB drive, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because there is there's limitations of how much data you can encrypt uh, because of the processor. So for documents, yes, movies probably not. <laughs> but that can place any uh, uh, micro SD card in there and it 
Yeah. No, yes, so that's a future feature. It's not released yet. We don't have a functionality for the SD card yet. But eventually you can put yeah, any SD card. So to say soon, in two weeks, I can use Yeah, yeah, in two weeks, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Um, this is actually a very like frequently asked questions, especially once we decided to support Bitcoin Cash. And we knew we were opening Pandora's box with that because then we had Bitcoin private, Bitcoin whatever, and no, we don't have any we don't have any rule about when it comes to that. So network stabilization and yeah, I, I mean, we, we used to say network stabilization, uh, nodes, uh, open source, and all these things, but then you know all these forks start doing that, and you can't just support hundreds of Bitcoin forks overnight. It's well, how was uh, we have Litecoin forks as well. Yeah, Litecoin forks too. Yeah, great. You know. <laughs> So how was the decision to to do the Bitcoin Cash? If you how was the decision to open Pandora's box then? Um, I mean, that, that's a good question. There was a big discussion that you yeah, had. Yeah, sure. I, I don't know how many we, fights between the teams. That <laughs> I don't know why we ended up doing that in the end. Um, <laughs> Maybe a lot of other reasons. I remember. I only remember like staying late in the office that, yeah. that the night we were releasing it because we had. Uh, it wasn't pretty, but we had. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would say because of the demand. Yeah, yes, a lot of pressure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. a lot of pressure. Uh, you mentioned I can write uh, applications for any coins myself, mm -hmm. uh, and you will release it after you uh, review it. Uh, but uh, can I also install it without? Yeah, uh, you on, on my ledger or uh, on, my, on my transfer? Um, you can, but the device will tell you that it's not authentic software mm -hmm. uh, because it's not signed, and then you have to acknowledge that you're okay with that risk. So there is no way that you can prevent anyone from yeah. installing it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. So zero. I, I don't think so. It's your, yeah. Also, uh, when it comes to software, when it comes to firmware support for the coins, we also need to have it supported by our backend, by the nodes that are running the blockchain. So if you so for instance when what coin is good? Yeah, well, any, any of the Bitcoin forks. Any of the Bitcoin so, forks. Yeah. Uh, so so you you need to support it in your backend. Uh, before backend. I can use it yeah. on my uh, on my hardware. So and before you can use it in Trezor Wallet. So the backend always only runs for the Trezor Wallet interface, the web wallet. But then yeah, for instance, you might have a Electrum uh, mm -hmm. that runs with I don't know by like Bitcoin whatever fork. Mm -hmm. and, and if you code it for the Trezor and you make sure that the implementation works with Electrum for Bitcoin, whatever not, then you can use it together. Okay. Yeah. So yes. you support um, the UTF standard, right? Yeah. So universal two-factor authentication. And the new one is PDO2, uh, or what about then? Uh, or what about the Z? Uh, so when does that come? Two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> no, we are working on that uh, for sure. Um, well, uh, Pavel just tweeted out like uh, that we are working on that, and we would love to see to see Fido two uh, being implemented at, at as many websites and services as possible, because we really believe that passwords are a thing of the last century, and they should be banned. <laughs> to say it's wrong word. But hopefully, you know, you never know, because U2F was also supposed to solve this, like, but second factor thing. It, right? So you already have, like, the metal metal thing, like, yeah. removed kind of thing, but it was always a second factor. But with Fido, there comes, like, the three different modes. So either mm -hmm. it's uh, passwordless. So basically, the public private key for the free is used. So um, you're using the, for everybody else, um, you have the master key, and you can use the master key to derive different private keys, either for Bitcoin or shit coins or whatever. Yeah. And you can also do that for um, basically the private key uh, for each different website. So basically, each different website has its own private key, and uh, it also has a public key. So you basically authenticate uh, each other. So the website authenticates that you can actually log in, and you at the same time can authenticate that um, the website is actually the one you want to talk to. Which um, removes a lot of attack vectors mm -hmm. like um, proxies, man in the middle attacks, and stuff like that. And it removes the I need to have one password for each account because it's automatically done yeah. with just deriving from the master key. Mm -hmm. 
and then there's the last passwordless. Um, and in the same standard, you have um, basically passwordless and pins, which is sort of like two-factor authentication because the pin is actually ended on the device, so it's never transmitted. So even if it's short, it's still secure enough because it's if you need to be asked or attacked physically to basically you receive that, so it's not a huge issue. And the third one is basically you combine it with an old password kind of type. So you can have your password manager or your thought out birthday as a password, which is bad by the way. And then you have passwordless as the additional authentication, and on top of that you can add pin for example. Yeah. And that's basically the feeder two center. Well hopefully we'll see it, yeah. So that will be fast then. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. I think the universal two factor authentication is part of the new standard. So that yeah. sort of was interesting to see. So the Trezor will use the same master seed, the 24 mnemonic or whatever, for the uh, authentication purposes. Well. The so there's a specific derivation part yeah. that's used for that and that's standardized. Exactly. So, yeah, that's awesome. And that brings one benefit that your keys, or if you break your device, you can recover it on another one and it still works. So I guess like him, uh, I feel a bit worried about having community written software on the device. So do you make sure that it's uh, like there's a community contribution of some whatever coin that it doesn't actually get executed and I use it for Bitcoin? Yes, uh, of course. I mean, the, uh, first of all, the code is all public. The, it follows the whole, it's the same thing. If, if they support, if they want to have the code support, they, the code has to be developed publicly and open in an open source fashion. I mean, some people are really good at like hiding uh, bad code, yeah. and making it look like it's good code. Yeah. yeah. There isn't any need for the because it's Python no. code. There, so there isn't any need for it to run during other coins, you know, yeah, other coins. Or ever. Or ever, yeah, yeah. And also, it's the cryptography is in C, so you know, if there are any pull pull requests to change the cryptography or you know to weaken it, then you would know you would see it. And that's also a big Yeah, sometimes you can like uh, exploit functions somehow because of timing. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs>